Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to a new episode um, about MPS and how to build languages with it. Um, yeah. Um, last yeah. Today we are going to take a look. At what continue with the with the things we started last time because we didn't quite finish everything. Um, in the last episode, um, yeah, so we have done some some additional um, features or added some additional features to the language last time. Um, mostly variable references with a um, corresponding scope that um, you can reference variables that you that were defined prior to the, the point um, where the cursor is in the program, so that the scoping doesn't allow forward references. Um, we also added our first little language extension here for tests. So we have a, a second language that allows us to define tests. Um, that language introduced a new statement. We use constraints to only allow the statement in test contexts and uh, nowhere else. And we also introduced the um, if statement here. Um, and uh, thank you for the follow, Frederico. Um, what currently is not working um, is uh, nested scopes. So um, if we are in the if statement here, we can't access any of the variables defined in the in the outer part of the program. Um, and this is something we would like to take a look at today. We would also like to add support for um, shadowing declarations. Accidentally, it already works because the outer variables are in scope, because here we have two variables with the name x. And um, while defining a second variable x in the same scope here would lead to an error um, that the name is duplicated. I would still like to allow to um, shadow variables in the inner scope. And I would like to take a look at uh, how to do that as well. Um, and while doing that, we would I would like to generalize our scoping implementation quite a bit because currently it's... Um, Quite hard coded here, so everything is in the in the variable reference. It's not uh, really reusable. Um, yeah. So this is what I would like to do today. Um, and after we have done that, um, I would like to take a look at how we can test our language because currently we haven't written a single test for anything um, in our language. Uh, we we don't really ensure that. Um, that our language is working correctly, that the type system works correctly. And um, while I gave a short introduction about what you can test uh, in a language in one of the earlier episodes where I went through all of the language aspects of MPS, um, I would like to, to write test for, tests for our, our language here. Um, yeah, apart from that, um, some organizational stuff. Um, I think I will um, shorten the episodes a bit. So currently they are roughly about two hours. Um, but talking for almost two hours, mostly non-stop in explaining what's going on in the uh, in the tool and why I'm doing certain things, it's quite exhausting. Um, so I would like to, to keep it down to 90 minutes, I guess. So somewhere between 90 minutes and, and, uh, and two hours. Uh, depending on on um, how I uh, how I feel during the during the episode and then um, cutting it at, at some of the uh, somewhere between 90 minutes and two hours um, and that might influence how much we can actually do during an episode so at least for next year I think I will do shorter episodes I don't know if I can do more episodes but uh, let's see 
Okay, so let's jump into it, I guess. Um, so what we added last time is this statement container, um, which only has a single method, I think. Yeah, here. Yeah. Um, so it allows you to get it allows us to get the statements that are in the current context, and then we used it in the scope here of the variable uh, reference. So we try to get the next statement, and then from there look for the next statement container. We have some workarounds here going on for the case where um, we are typing on an empty line. Um, this is basically when this statement context is null. Um, this is in the case where we are on an empty line here and we would like to type foo. Where are my fingers here? So foo, and then we would like to transform it into a, a valid um, variable reference. And to do that, we need to first wrap it into, into an expression statement. Um, and that means the, the actual statement that we would usually use as a context does not exist. Um, so this is why this, this if statement and the, um, the position argument that we get is only used in the case where we don't have a, um, a statement to look for. Um, but in here, <coughs> there, the only thing we, we actually need to calculate the scope is the statement container and the, the statement. Um, so it's not really so much about um, about the uh, the variable here itself. Yes, we filter the the elements here um, of the of the statements to the to only include variable declarations. We look for the index and stuff like this. But um, we I think we can also um, generalize this quite a bit. Um, so in the case where we have the if statement, um, the if statement should create a new nested scope that is only contributing to things um, in the if statement. Um, but it should also include the, the parent scope from the workbook here in this case. Um, and one thing we could do is so we could add all of this here, right? So handle the case where we have um, a nested statement container and then walk up to the next statement container and get those statements and include them into the, the scope as well. Um, we could also hide that um, behind the implementations of the get statement uh, statements method. Um, that would be one way to do it. Um, but then we would still encode all of this here into the into the scoping rules somehow directly as 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 code here in the scoping aspect. And I think it would be quite nice if we could somehow um, generalize this a bit and also place this um, in a different location than 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 here. Um, and if I remove the scope declaration here for a second. Um, when we opened the code completion menu, we saw something at the very beginning which we didn't really take a look at, and this is this uh, inherited scope. And uh, when we select inherited from the code completion menu, we can um, select a concept where it should inherit the scope from. And what would happen if we say it should inherit the scope from our variable? Um, variable, the variable here. Um, so right now, nothing will actually happen if we do this. So let's rebuild the language and see what's going on now. Now everything is broken. So MPS complains that all of our references are out of scope. So how does this um, inherit scope uh, in MPS work? 
because it looks quite declarative, we could just tell that uh, we would like to inherit the scope for a variable at this point. And um, what we need to do to get this working is uh, we need to define a scope provider. And scope provider is basically an interface in uh, MPS. If we search for scope, scope provider here, we can see that there's an interface in, um, uh, in language core. We can take a look at that. So the interface here itself, it has no properties, um, but it has some behavior. And here you can see that the interface has essentially two methods and both of them return a scope. Yes, they carry a, a default implementation, um, but we could, um, so these methods allow you to return a scope. And what we implemented in the, in the variable scope uh, constraints aspect here is basically something that returned a scope as well, right? So the um, implementation here directly in these, uh, in the constraint aspect was giving us a bunch of parameters about the context, and then we needed to return a scope. And instead of placing this directly in the constraint aspect, uh, what we can do is uh, we can implement this interface on a concept somewhere in the AST, and then MPS will look for a scope provider uh, in the current context, and call these methods on the um, on the uh, instance of the scope provider. So let's try that. Um, the thing that in our language at the moment is contributing to the scope is the basically the statement container because the statement container contains all the statements that are currently in scope for, for a reference to a variable. Um, so let's see if we could can implement the um, scope provider on the statement container itself. So that as soon as you implement the statement container interface, you also get the default implementation of the scope um, as well. So Let's add the interface here, so scope provider. So our statement container extends the scope provider. And now let's go to the behavior aspect. And let's try to implement it um, with just the, um, the two methods that we have here and the abstract method that would return all the statements that are currently in scope. Um, the default implementations for these methods don't really give us a clue what we are supposed to do here because the one implementation calls into the other and the other just returns null. So um, what can we implement here? Um, similar to what we did in the implementation directly in the constraint aspect, we would like to calculate the scope. And we get some some arguments here from uh, from the method si method signature, um, and you can see that there is one that so so both of them take the kind, um, and the kind is basically the thing or the concept that the scope is calculated for, and this is the concept that we reference here in the inherit uh, part of the scope declaration. So in our case, if we write um, that the scope for the variable reference uh, for the for the reference of for the reference to a variable on our concept variable reference um, is inherited from the B variable, which is our variable declaration. MPS would then pass in the B variable reference, uh, B variable as a kind to our um, get scope methods here. So that's the first thing we get. 
Um, this is the same for both of these signatures from the method. And then they are a bit different here. Yeah. So one includes a child. So this is um, the context. Let's see if this is actually documented here. No, it's, uh, it's not, okay. Um, so um, as I know the API, so this is the child where the, the scope is, um, is calculated on. Um, this could be, for instance, the um, the uh, look. So I think it's the it's the child of the uh, of the statement container where the scope is calculated on. So in our case, this um, would be a statement, I guess. And then there is a second method that uh, has different parameters. So it takes a containment link and an index. And this is for the other case which we implemented here. Uh, let's take a look. So in one case we have this, um, we have the statement context here available, which is when the context node um, allows us to access a statement. And then we just take, in our case, the index of the statement. But in the case where we don't have the context yet, we take like the position that MPS is, uh, is giving us. And what these two methods are for is for basically distinguishing those two use cases. So one is the use case where you have um, the AST already constructed um, to a degree that MPS knows what the child is um, that you are calculating the scope on. And the other one is where there is simply no child available yet. Um, but where you um, get the information where the um, where the scoping was called, so at which position, and in which um, of the child uh, in which link uh, of the concept. Okay, so let's start with the with the um, with the easier case where we already have a child available, and let's take a look at how the implementation looked in um, our uh, original. Uh, variable reference scope here. So in the case where we have a statement available, we simply took the index of the statement and then called get statements on the statement container and uh, compared to all the uh, compared the index of the variable declarations in there to the index where we are looking for. Um, so let's try to implement that in the other method here as well. Okay, so first of all, let's check if we are really looking for a, um, for a variable. So the kind here is a concept and we can basically check if it's a subconcept of our variable declaration like this. And in the other case, let's just return null, um, just like the default implementation would do. So for other concepts, we don't have a scope implementation yet yet and let's just focus on the on the variable here for now okay so what did we do in the um in the scope then so we walked up to the statement container in the ast um we don't need to do this because the scope is already calculated by um the statement container here so let's then see what we did with the statement container so we um called get statements and then filtered the statements by vari variable declaration and compared the index to the index of the statement. So let's see if we can do that here as well. So child in this case is our um, our statement where we are in the um, in the AST. Um, but so first of all, let's get all statements in the current context. Um, filter them by variables. Okay. And now we need to compare the index. Oh, let's not do that for now. Let's just start here with the naive implementation where we have everything in scope to see if it's actually working. So four named elements and then all the statements. Oh, we have to return this. 
Okay. Mm. Let's remove the original implementation here and replace this with the inherit variable. Okay. Let's see what happens now. And all of our variables are in scope again. If we press control space here, everything works as it did before, but instead of having the um, implementation directly in the variable reference, we are now um, telling the scoping system of MPS, um, please look for something that can provide a scope for a variable. And then it looks in the AST if it can find some a node in the hierarchy that implements the statement, uh, the scope provider here. And in this case, our statement container is uh, extending, uh, is implementing a, a scope provider, and the statement container interface is implemented by the if statement, by the test case, and by the workbook. So all of them automatically get the implementation that we did for the a scope provider on the statement container. And the, sta the implementation here for the scope provider is basically um, giving uh, now like all variables declared in the current scope. So this is still broken because we can reference things that have not been, that, that weren't declared yet. So I can type X here and this is valid. I mean, I get a type system error here that the operation is not supported, but I'm allowed to reference X here, and let's get rid of that again. Um, okay, so one thing I need to find out is uh, what is the actual um, child that we get here, um, because the API doesn't document it. So let's see what we can do here to get this information. So one idea would be we could just set a breakpoint here um, but I haven't set up debugging um, and I haven't told you yet how to do that. Um, I guess this is part of a different episode then, so let's resort to good old printf debugging, I guess. Um, so MPS features a way to, to print out messages and these messages then end up here in the message window um, down here below. So there's a tool window called messages where you can print with this message statements here. Um, let's just see what we have here. So I'm just printing out the child's concept um, so that we can see what is the node that the scoping system passes into our um, into our scope implementation here. Let's run make. Go to the messages here. See if it prints. Okay, as you can see, uh, MPS now, when I press control space, calls the scoping here. Um, and if I do this here, deep nested into the plus, uh, we still can see that we get the, um, the variable that we declared here. Uh, so MPS is already doing the right thing and we don't need to manually look for the ancestor as we did before. Um, and we can just take this um, child here um, and look at the index of it um, and then look to all uh, and then use this to filter out the variable declarations that are not yet in scope. So just like before we add a where here where it.index is actually smaller than the um, child index. You can see a lot of stuff is simplified by that because MPS is doing some work for us here to um, to to navigate the AST implicitly behind the scenes. So we don't need to do this um, manually as we did before. Um, let's take a look if it now works. Uh, if I press plus X here, nothing happens. Okay, so X is no longer in scope. That's good. That is what we actually wanted to do. Um, okay. Now let's take a look what happens if uh, we are on an empty uh, line here and if any variables are in scope. So let's open the 
code completion menu. And as you can see, the code completion menu does not contain any of uh, the variables that we declared. It allows us to type whatever other expressions um, that we defined because we have the, the wrap actions um, that allow us to type expressions at places where um, statements are expected, but none of our variables are in scope. Um, so MPS is definitely not calling this scope implementation then because if we take a look at the at the messages here and I clear the um, the message window and I now press control space here um, what we can see is that uh, MPS calls the um, the implementation that we wrote but the child is null in this case um, and why does it happen? So let's go here to our scope provider implementation. So somehow we end up in our method here with a child null. This is why we print out null here. Um, and let's take a look at the default implementation here that we use. So what you can see here is that um, the default implementation of get scope with the, with the, the three arguments, which includes the index and the link, um, simply calls into the normal other get scope implementation, but um, passes in null as the child here. And um, let's see if this method is actually called while we um, while we are in this state where um, there is no. Um, no statement held, so let's print a message here, get scope. Um, yeah. And let's go here, and the message window again, clear it, control space. And what you can see is that first our get scope implementation with the three arguments is called and then we call down to the um, other implementation while in the case where we are here um, you can see that the get scope implementation with the three arguments is not even uh, considered at all it's directly calling down to the implementation that accepts the child okay so it seems like mps has already detected the case where we try to um, replace um, the empty line here and where we don't have any context available because the surrounding expression statement is not created yet. Um, so looks like it's less work for us, but we still need to somehow handle this case in our scope implementation. Okay, let's remove the, um, the message here and also here so that we don't pollute the message window. Um, so let's first check again if we are looking for um, an actual variable declaration. So if the kind is a subconcept of our variable, then we want to do something special. Um, and let's then, so what we need to do then is uh, we need to get the statements again then we obviously want to filter them that there are only variables here and now we want to select all the variables declared prior to the current position and this is now where we can use the index here that mps is passing into the function so um, it dot index is smaller than the index that mps is giving us as a context information and then we Put all this into a list score. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Looks like my keyboard just disconnected. Why? Now the second time it happened.
let's check. Okay, connection is back, so let's undo this. Go back here, okay. Um, so what we want to do is we want to create a new list scope um, with list scope from named elements or for named elements and then we pass in our select part here and then we return it. Okay, let's rebuild and see if it actually works. Yeah, I'm on an empty line here. I open the code completion menu and now you can see that bar, foo, c, x, y, z, um, all of the variables defined prior here are in scope and let's see if it also works in between. Yes, so here only bar, z, z, and uh, y are in scope. So everything works as expected. But now we still don't have any nesting going on, right? So in our if statement here, the scoping works um, just as for the workbook, uh, but it still only shows the variables defined in the if statement and not the variables defined in the outer, um, outer part. Um, so what can we do to uh, to get this working? So let's take a look at the list scope itself. Um, so the list scope itself has no real interesting methods for us, I guess, that we could use to net use to um, nest things. Um, so let's take a look at what other scope implementations exist in MPS. Um, and let's just see who is extending the scope class here. So I just pressed um, Control H. Um, it should work on all platforms, no matter if Windows or um mac yeah and that is then bringing up the um the concept hierarchy here in this case it's the class hierarchy so we can see all the um classes that uh, somehow extend the abstract scope implementation here so let's take a look there's something here composite scope um So at the moment we are simply returning, so let me collapse everything here uh, like this, okay. We have the scope and then below the scope there's like a composite scope, delegating scopes, empty scopes. Um, at the moment we are using the list scope, um, which is like the simplest implementation um, you can find in MPS. But maybe composite scope looks what we would like to do, right? We want to, want to actually compose um, a single scope, uh, a single scope out of multiple. Um, and the constructor here takes a um, a list of or, or has a um, a variable arc a var arc uh, implementation here, which allows us to pass in an arbitrary number of scopes. Um, and there's also like a, a static create method here which takes yeah also a variable argument uh, list of scopes so let's try if we can somehow use that one to uh, compose different uh, scope implementations together okay um if we take a look at the ast um in our little example here with the if statement. Um, so let's open the Node Explorer here for the workbook and take a look what's actually going on in the um, in the AST. What's the structure here? So we have the workbook on top, and then there's a bunch of um, instances in the uh, in the content role here, and one of them is the if statement. Um, and then in the if statement, the then part 
has a bunch of content as well. So if we are at, I don't know, the variable declaration Y here, and we go up to the next scope provider, um, then we can see that the next scope provider would be the if statement, because the if statement is a um, statement container and our statement container is a scope provider. Um, thank you for the follow, Velocity. Um, and then the statement container implementation is our scope provider and the scope provider here has our default implementation and the only thing we need to um, add to it, oh, let me make, get this code a bit bigger, yeah, the only thing we need to really implement in one of our statement containers is how to actually get to these statements. Um, okay, back to the workbook and the AST structure. So when we are in the variable declaration here Y and we walk up to the MPS automatically walks up to the next scope provider, it finds the, the if statement here. And then from the if statement, it we would like to include all of the things that are in the workbook. So we would like to tell MPS somehow, um, okay, yes, I have calculated the scope for our um, if statement here, but please uh, continue to look for other scope providers um, in the hierarchy that could contribute to um, to, the, to the overall scope um, that we have here. Um, so how can we do this? Um, if we go back to our statement container and to the implementation, what we would like to do ideally is um, we have our list scope that contains all variables. And now we would like to somehow um, create a composite scope. Create with our variables, but it should also include the um, parent scope. So everything that is defined upwards um, from our current position in the AST. And luckily, I can find the right language to import, I think. Yeah, so MPS features a language called, um, called scopes. Um, let's go there. Lang dot scope no, scope dot structure. Um, or scopes it's called. And the language itself is quite simple. It has four concepts, and one of them is named parent scope. Um. And it's exactly doing what the name says. It's getting you the parent scope definition in the current context, if there is any. Um, and you can use it here in the behavior aspect of the language to tell MPS, okay, I have calculated the scope, but please also include the things that um, are somewhere above me in the AST and don't uh, stop searching at my uh, scope provider implementation. So if, if there is any, include it. So let's try it here. So what we tell MPS here, please create a composite scope out of our scope for the variables here, which is just a plain list of, uh, of variables in the current statement container. But then please also take a look at um, other scope implementations. If you can find any, include them as well um, into the scope definition. And now let's rebuild and see if this is actually doing what we want. Okay, so up here, everything should still work. Okay, yes, our scoping here works. And now into the if statement and it doesn't work. Nice. Ah, uh, okay. I know what the problem there is. Okay. Um, yeah. So it works when we are inside of a variable declaration, um, but it doesn't 
when we are on an empty line. So why is this the case? Because I forgot something. And that's, I only told MPS in the case where uh, the AST is constructed to a reasonable degree. Uh, we want to include the parent scope. But here in the implementation that we use on the empty lines, um, I didn't do that yet. So it only works in the case where we are um, already in a variable declaration at the moment. But here you can see that it's now including um, the outer elements here, C, Y, bar, etc. So bar is here, we can reference that. And if we follow the reference by control B, um, we go up to the um, variable declaration B in the outer scope. Um, but one thing, one thing you might also notice here is uh, there's two times x here. So let's select one of them and follow it. Okay, this is the x defined in the uh, inner if statement. Let's select the other one and now follow the reference. And now you can see that we have the outer X in scope as well. So this is quite a bit confusing. MPS can handle this because um, we are not resolving the reference every time by name. Uh, when the user selects something from the code completion menu, MPS behind the scenes stores all the information um, it needs to uh, reference the, um, the variable declaration here. And in this case, it doesn't matter that they have the same name because for MPS, technically, these are two totally different declarations and technically it can reference it without any problem. But I don't want to allow this um, because it's quite confusing for the user. Um, what I would like to do is um, I would like to hide the outer X here so that you cannot reference it in the uh, inner block here for the if statement if there is a variable with the same name. Uh, but first, let's fix the empty line case before we move on to the other one. Um, here, just like in the case for um, the well constructed AST. Uh, we just store the scope here, uh, variables, and now we create a composite scope. Create variables and include the parent scope. Like this. And now it should work in both cases. Let's rebuild and see. That is actually the case. Yeah, now on an empty line, the scope also includes the outer part, just as we want it to have it. Okay, so how can we do um, this um, this shadowing or hiding based on, um, on the name? Um, we could write our own scope implementation, obviously, which uh, somehow checks the names um, and then somehow hides the elements based on the name. Uh, but if we take a look at the hierarchy here, the class hierarchy, oh, just to wrong display here. Like this. If we take a look here at the class hierarchy of scope, um, there is a composite scope, delegating scope, empty scope, but there's also something called hiding by name scope. And this sounds quite like what we would uh, like what we want to do, right? We want to hide things that have the same name. Um, I mean, we can take a look here at the implementation, but I don't think it's it's really interesting. Um, if you like to, you can just go to the hide by name implementation. Um, but it's essentially doing what we would like to do. Um, it's hiding uh, elements from the scope if they have the same name. And does it have, yeah, okay, it has no, no static methods to um, create an instance of it, like the 
um, like the composite scope had, um, but it has a constructor here. And it seems like the constructor takes uh, the concept it should operate on. And the kind and a scope and a parent scope. So let's see if we can get this somehow working. Um, let's try it in the in this case here first. Um, new hide by name scope. Hiding. Oh, it's not in scope, so we have to import it. Scope is not in scope. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, hiding concept. I think there is no documentation available here. No, sadly not. Mm -hmm. I guess this is the... So that's the concept that is hiding. And it has to be I named concept let's just pass in the variable for now because variable is our iname concept is it hiding concept or hidden concept hiding concept okay okay second argument is kind let's just pass in the kind we were looking for anyway um, and then the scope, this is, I guess, our scope. So it's the variables. And then the fourth parameter is the parent scope. So let's include the parent scope here. Let's just return that instead of the composite one. Let's see what happens. Rebuild. Ah, yeah, you're right. There's a comment in the implementation. Uh, let's take a look at that. Hiding root. All con subconcepts of hiding root hide each other. Yeah, okay. So all subconcepts of the variable. Yeah, we want to hide all subconcepts of the variable that have the same name as the um as uh, um as a variable that is already in scope. I think this is what we would like to do. Um, let's see if it works. Um, let's go to the inner scope here and see how many x is in scope. So there's only one x now. Let's take a look at which one. Okay, it's now the outer one that is hiding the inner one. Oh no, it's not. Uh, I'm on X here, so let's go down here. Uh, X is not in scope yet there, so there is only one X available before we have defined the, the second X. Um, and then, yeah, so here on this X where we haven't, def we have not, we, we are still defining X, which should hide the um, the outer X later on. The outer axis should st still be in scope. Um, and it seems that, yeah, it is in scope. And now here at Y, X should not be in scope twice. Okay, that's correct. Um, and now let's see where this one is pointing. Yeah, okay. So this is now hiding the... Um, the uh, outer implementation, just like we uh, wanted to do. Um, okay, that seems to work. So now we have to do it for the other case as well, I guess. Um, yeah, here we are still using a composite scope. Let me just copy and paste it here. Yeah, let's rebuild and see if it also works for empty lines now. Yeah, on the empty line, there's only one X in scope here and hopefully it's the inner one. Yeah. Okay, seems to work. Um, as we expected, 
because we wanted it to work here. So only one X here in scope and it's the inner one. And let's see what happens if I move code from here down into the, ah, okay. this is not using a variable that has been shadowed. Um, is there something using X here? No, not yet. So let's use X. Like this. I mean, it's broken from the type system perspective. I uh, know why I copy and paste this. So, uh, then MPS is rebinding the stuff based on the names. Okay. Um, I actually can't move it in the outer scope yet. Okay. But seems like it was working as we wanted it. So if we move this here, oh no, we should move something that is actually using the inner one uh, in our X plus 12. And now let's copy and paste it to the outer one. Yeah, okay. And now here we also get the, we were able to copy and paste the code that was using inner X and but if we move it to the outer scope um, where we, where it's not in scope, usually uh, MPS complains. Okay, so this also works as we, we wanted it to work. Okay, so seems like our scoping is working. Uh, let me commit that first um, before we start with the implementation of some tests, um, edit, hiding, by name for variables. And we also added nested scopes. Scopes for variables. Let's commit that. Okay. So this is what um what I wanted to do for scopes for now, um, it's, uh, um, so showing how you can nest scopes, um, how you can use scope providers to generalize your scope implementation. So we're here on the, on the statement container, we now have our scope provider implementation. And as long as you don't want to customize how the scope is calculated, the only thing you need to uh, implement to get um, even nested scopes working is just override the um, uh, implement the, the get statements method uh, correctly uh, to return all the statements that are available in the current container. And then you basically get the uh, other things for free by just um, uh, uh, inheriting them here from our statement container. Um, Let's actually see if it still works for, if it also works here for our um, test cases. Um, okay, X and Y are here. Let's add an if statement. Um, X greater than two. Oh. And let's just X. And here they are also in scope. And now something X and yeah. So no matter where we are um, in our, uh, no matter if it's in a test case or um, in our worksheet, uh, workbook, um, the scoping works um, with the generic implementation on the container. Okay. Now let's take a look at um, tests for our language. Um, I think for scopes, that's it, um, what I wanted to show. Um, if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to ask them in chat now. Um, by the way, you can always ask questions in chat. Um, I'm trying to keep an eye on that on it. Um, sometimes I might um, take one or two minutes to see if you ask something. If I'm uh, uh, implementing some some uh, code here, but uh, otherwise I always try to keep an eye on the chat. Um, if you don't have any questions to scopes at the moment, I would uh, proceed in uh, taking a look at uh, tests for the next 30 or 40 minutes um, and uh, show you some of the things we can uh, test uh, for our language. Um, I have also written a blog post about testing in MPS in general, if you are interested in that. 
Um, it's yeah, to some degree, not the best blog post I ever wrote. It um, in some cases, it's still poorly written um, because if I wrote it in a hurry, and it was something I really wanted to get out there. Um, Marcos did a great job on uh, on resurrecting uh, most parts of it uh, with his copy editing. Um, but still there are some parts which I would like to clear up, but I haven't really had the time yet. Um, so if you're interested in that, I, I just put the link in chat. Um, but it more it looks more at the perspective what you would like to test in MPS and why. It's not so much about how. Um, yeah, and it's my it's a question I get a lot um from from people um what they should actually test in um uh, in their languages in MPS. And I try to to sum up our learnings from the past five, six years of MPS usage there. Um, so that it's mostly about thinking why you want to test something and then you can see um, how to actually test that. And today we will take a look at how to test things. I won't talk much about the, the philosophy or or the, the ideas about why you test certain aspects of your language. Um, I will mostly talk about how. So let's add tests to our language. Um, tests in MPS can, you can add tests in MPS directly to the language definition. So if you right click on the language and then open the new menu, you can see that there is a tests aspect, um, which would allow you to um, add tests directly into a language. I'm not that big of a fan this kind of uh, of way to writing tests, I personally prefer to just put them into a into a separate solution and then write the tests there. Um, mostly because it simplifies things from the from the build perspective, and you have a clear separation between the actual language implementation and the tests. Um, yeah, so I rarely use the test aspect of a language directly. Um, so how do I usually define tests? Um, the first thing I do is I add a new solution to uh, the project, which I typically call um, like um, a language. So in this case, basic language. language. And then dot test. So it's a normal solution, nothing special here yet. And then I press OK. Um, yes, I want to add it to the Git index. OK. So now we have an empty solution. And now let's add a model to it. And when you open the new model dialog here, now you can give the model a name. Um, and the first thing I would like to test is some, some type system stuff. So let's call it type system tests.typesystem. system. Um, and now there is here the drop down menu right of the um, actual name. And this is um, the stereotype of the um, model that you can select. There is no header telling you that, but you have to know it. So um, you can select tests here. Um, and this is what we want to do. We want to create a model that um, contains tests. And um, by selecting tests here as a stereotype, we basically tell MPS um, what we are going to place in this model is uh, is tests um, and if we press OK now and add the model to the um, to the git index MPS automatically opens the, um, the model properties here um, and in the dependencies it hasn't added anything yet but um, if we take a look at the used languages uh, we can see that MPS automatically uh, imported a set of languages for us in this case, it's the um, the test language and the unit test language. So this is the basic set of languages that um, that we can use to to test um, our own language implementation. Okay, and now we have a, a model here. It shows up under the under the test root um, up here, and um, now we would like to add a test. 
Um, so in the new menu here, you can see that there's the, the unit test language. If we um, create a new B test case here, this is basically um, a J unit test case with a bit of um, syntactic sugar around it. Um, but this is not what I would like to do. I don't want to write a, a normal um, J unit test case uh, at this point. I would like to do something more specific to a language. Let's get rid of this one. Okay. Um, what else is here in the new menu? If we go to the um, to the test language down here, we can see that there are three um, test case concepts here. One is editor tests. Um, one is a migration test, and the third one is uh, the notes test case. Um, I gave a brief overview about these uh, individual tests um, in, uh, I think, think the first or second episode. Um, you might want to um, take a look at that one as well. Um, so the editor tests, as the name suggests, are used to test your editor implementation. Uh, migration tests, testing migrations. Mm. And then there's notes test. And notes test is quite a generic thing. Um, let's create one. Um, <coughs> it expects us uh, uh, to, to assign a name here. Um, let's just try to test if um, if our uh, types were correctly. So I just call the test case types uh, test case types for now. And now there is a section up here notes and a section test methods and then a section utility methods. Uh, yeah, utility methods. And the notes part here is the actual interesting part um, because it allows us to um, use our language and um, define a program or an AST uh, with the concepts of our language. And then we can uh, test it. So how do we do this? Um, if we press enter here, MPS creates this note to check thing. Um, what was that? Oh, nothing important. Okay, so... Um, Let's take a look at uh, the node test here. If we open the uh, code completion menu here, what you can see is um, it shows a bunch of concepts. If we select something, oh, this was actually nothing interesting. Um, you can see that MPS inserts like the, the, the program element into uh, into the test case here. Um, but what I would like to 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 test on is a workbook. So let's see if the workbook is available here. It's not the workbook. Nope. Okay. So what we need to do to get um, the workbook in here is that we want to import a language, and in this case, it's our basic language. And now let's take a look if we have the workbook available. Yes. So I would like to do some tests with the workbook. Um, if I select it from the code completion menu, MPS uh, shows us uh, this, uh, this dialog. Uh, no, shows us the instance of, uh, of our workbook, sorry. Okay, so we can give it a name, my workbook under test, I guess. And now what we can do is we can use our language in the same way we would uh, use it in um, in the sandbox here, uh, we can basically define a workbook. So let's define a variable, x, initialize it to one. And now if I define a variable that has the same name in the same scope, right, we have this error message. So we, have, we wrote this uh, checking rule in one of the very first episodes. Um, here for the, let's go to the definition of the error here. So this checking rule for a workbook that uh, checks if we have um, a variable with the same name twice in the 
Quack, quack. One thing I noticed is that this would only work on workbooks at the moment, so it's not really aware of nested scopes yet. So we might want to do something about that later. Um, okay. Now we have the vari two variables x here, and now the error message is already shown correctly. Um, but we somehow want to um, test that this error is um, attached to the uh, that this error is actually displayed to the user in case we define two variables with the same name. Um, how can we do this? Um, the testing language here of MPS allows us to first of all write a program or construct the AST, however you would like to call it. Um, and um, now what we can do is we can annotate onto the program where we expect errors. And to do so, uh, MPS has an intention here available. Um, one is called um, add common test annotation. And if we select that from the intentions menu, MPS is adding this, this check um, around our variable declaration here. And now the cursor is placed on the right here, so if I open the code completion menu uh, what we can do is uh, we what we see here is that there are quite a bunch of options here so we can check for data flow uh, messages we can also check for error messages uh, we can also check that something has an error um, I guess this is what we would like to do right we want to check if our variable um, has an error attached to it if we select that from the code completion menu, what happens is that um, now this has this uh, check whether has error is um, attached to our variable, and um, let's run the test. Actually, how can we run tests? Um, the easiest way is just go to the uh, test case here, right click, and um, now say run test. Uh, Run types test here. Okay, let's select that and uh, the test failed. Why? Because the project path was not. Uh, let me get this bigger here. So all tests of the we only have one test and this has failed. And um, what we are getting here is an error message that MPS complains. Um, it could not um, open the project path in the test info here. You can also see that there's a warning here. And the warning says uh, that there is no test info pointing to the test project. Um, so let's do what MBS complaining about. Um, Let's right click on the model here and under the tests uh, language you can see that we can also create a test info. Let's do that. Um, now it wants us to specify a path. Um, mm -hmm, let's see what happens if we don't do it. I guess it will fail again. Yeah. Um, Okay, so somehow we need to tell MPS where the project is located. Um, well, now let's do it the hard coded way. Let me get the location on disk where it's actually located. And then here. And this here. And it's just pasted in here. So, what uh, MPS expects us to do is that we specify where it can. Um, where it can find the project where the tests um, should execute in. I'm not sure why this would be required if you run it um, directly from within the IDE, but uh, for some reason MPS decided that it's required. So let's uh, run the tests again. Okay. And now what happened is that the test was successful. Um, yeah, there's a warning that we execute this thing in, in the same process. Um, we don't care about that for now. Um, okay. 
So let's see if we can actually fail the test here. So right now we um, we checked that um, they are. Um, we have a check here for the on error on the on the variable x here. So let's remove the the, um, the checking uh, rule here that produces the error. So let me comment out the error statement, rebuild the language, and now the error should no longer exist here on the second variable because the, the checking rule was basically disabled and it's not reporting any any errors anymore. Um, and now let's rerun the test. And oh, it closed. Okay. So here's it. Now you can see that um, the test failed. And if we take a look why it failed, so there's the assert exception. Um, but what we can see here as well is so that there is an assertion failure, denote x, um, which is our variable up here, uh, does not have uh, the exp an expected error message. Okay, so the test seems to work. So when the node here has an error, um, we uh, the test succeeds, but if the error is gone, um, the test fails. Let's add back the error here, rebuild, and run the test again. Yeah, run, press the play button, and now it's successful. Okay, so this seems to work, um, but it would be nice if we could so right now, the only thing we tell MPS here, okay, is check that this variable X has some error message. We don't tell MPS that it should have a um, uh, an explicit error message, right? Um, there's this no error ref here that you can see in the editor that already hints um, to the fact that it might be possible to reference the error that we that we are expecting. Um, so let's do that. Um, if we open the code completion menu here, nothing shows up. So how can we actually tell MPS what's the error um, that we expect here? Um, there's an intention for doing that. And so let's remove everything here, the check as well, um, like this, and go to our X variable here again and open the intentions menu. Um, there is the add common test annotation, which we used before. There's also add has error test annotation. If we select this, um, this is basically a shortcut for what we uh, manually added, um, like uh, having a check annotation that checks that there is an error um, at this uh, location. Um, what else is there? There's has warning, which as the name suggests, adds like an assertion here that we want to have a warning in case our type system would report warnings, which we don't do at the moment. Mm. This is the common stuff we used before, test label. This is also not what we want to do. There's specify rule reference here. So if we select that, what happens is that MPS um, behind the scenes um, checked what, um, what error, is present here at the variable x and then automatically edit the assertion so that we want to check the variable x for an error and that this error is the duplicate name error that we uh, defined here in our uh, uh, checking rule. So if we do a command click here and we follow um, the reference um, MPS here automatically figured out, okay, this variable x has an error message and the error message was produced by this particular statement in this checking room. And now what it has done is it has added this information to the, um, to the uh, assertion here. We can rerun the code and um, run the test case again. And now what we can see is that um, the test is still green. So let's see if we can somehow uh, produce a second error message here. Um, yeah. 
let's negate this condition and add an else part just for the sake of um, uh, the example here some other error than the expected one and also report it on the variable yeah let's rebuild this so now in this case um the uh the error message is not the duplicate name message that um that we would expect um yeah obviously now all variables even if the names are not duplicated have an error but we don't care for that at the moment so what i would like to show is that if i now run the test here um what you can see is that the test failed um even though the node uh has an error message so if we remove the check here we can see that there is an error present on the variable x but in this case it's not our duplicate name error it's the other error message i just defined um and now the test fails because um it's not the error message that we actually expected but something different so the test language also supports like referencing the um the exact error message that you are expecting um so let's undo all of that here so that we get back to a, a normal working state like this okay so let's do the next thing here and uh, define an if statement and now what i would like to do is um i would like to have to check if duplicate names um, in an if statement are detected as well. So just as in the outer workbook, I would like to ensure that even if you define uh, two variables with the same name in an if statement, um, that this is an error. Whatever, we just need some condition here. Uh, and now let's define a variable y it to one and now i define a second variable y and it has no error message so the first thing i could do is i can do now is i can add a has warning annotation here uh, has error annotation here sorry um, because i want to assert in the test that um, this particular variable y has a warning uh, has an error message as well um, I don't say which error message I'm expecting here at the moment. I just say, okay, I have two variables with the same name in the same scope, so this should be an error. Let's run the tests. And now we can see one check was successful. If we double click here in the uh, in the test view and we double click on the um, on the test case, MPS takes us to the uh, assertion here so the check has duplicate name that one was successful um, and if i click on the failed one we can see that the check here on the variable y was not successful okay so let's try to get this test green um i want to have the same error as on the other one so let's go to the rule that is actually producing the the error messages here and what we can see is that the check okay, first of all the name of this checking rule is pretty poor so it should check for duplicate variable names and then it's also not only applicable to workbooks um, so we want to check if there are duplicate variable names in a statement container, I guess. Um, so like this. Okay, so now something has gone out of scope here and that's that the content is no longer accessible. Yeah, and this is because our statement container itself has no, no content definition, but it has a method to get all the the statements that is then implemented by the individual statement containers um so let's get all the statements from the container 
And then we want to check if in a statement container there's more than one variable declaration with the same name. Let's do this here and rebuild. And now let's run our test again. And now both tests are green because our variable declaration y now also has an error. If I would define a second y here and see that we also get the error message here. Um, what MPS is doing when you are attaching these has error um, or has warning annotations to a part of your program, then it will hide these error messages um, from the normal model checking here. So as you can see, even that the second variable y here usually has a, um, normally would have a model checking error here and you would get two of these red markers on the side of the program. Um, and you also get the red arrow marker directly here. Um, as soon as you attach the, the assertion, MPS will hide that um, so that you can, that you have a chance if you want to construct invalid um, invalid programs with your, your language and you would like to test them, then that only error messages that are not expected are showing up here so that the Otherwise, if you have a bunch of test cases that are testing for all various kinds of errors, um, the whole um, editor here would be completely unusable because there's basically everything would be read. So MPS is a bit smart here and hides these things for you. Um, let's remove that one as well. Um, okay, so now you can see that only expected errors are in the program. So for the uh, ones that are expected, it's not showing them in the editor anymore. Now, I'm sure that the variable y here has an error message and now I would like to um, ensure that it's the correct error message. So how can we do that? Um, just as before, we can invoke the uh, specify rule reference um, and test annotation intention here. And now MPS will um, add this assertion to the um, the test uh, here so that it's really this error message that was presented there. We can also test that other errors are present. So if we would define, I don't know, two variable, yeah, let's drop something. So let's uh, define a variable comparing. strings if we would define two string literals here and we would uh, and we invoke a, a binary expression on it uh, which is not supported uh, we get an error message here as well so what we like to assert is that our creator operation here has an error so just like before Go here and say specify rule reference. And now MPS adds the check and the um, has error and the reference to the corresponding um, error statement in the type system. And if we run the tests again, we can see that now there are three tests. That MPS has executed, so basically those three checking um, parts here. Okay, but now sometimes I don't want to um, check if an error is present somewhere, but I would like to check that um, the, the program has no errors. How can I do that? Okay, so we want to ensure that this variable declaration x here has no errors. Um, what we can do is we can add a common test annotation here. And now we just want to say, check if this node has error messages. So this four errors is basically what um, 
for errors is basically what you would like to do in this case. So you select this here. And if I press run button again, now there's four tests. And um, this is now uh, the first test that is executed that is checking that the variable x here has no errors present on it. Um, this also works um, for all the children. So what I would like to do is, um, let's go here and define a second workbook. Um, here. What I would like to do here is I would like to define a workbook um, that has no errors. Bar x one plus row three bar y equals x plus ten. And now I would like to tell MPS, okay. I have. I want to test that the workbook that here uh, is written, uh, that that I that I constructed here, um, has no errors whatsoever. So not on any of the parts in the um, in the workbook here. I'm expecting um, that there is an error, and if an error is present, then please fail uh, the test for me. And we can do that by specifying that we would like to check the complete workbook for error messages and this will also include all of the things contained in the workbook so it's um it's basically iterating through all of the um of the parts here um in the workbook so the variable then going down into the initializer going down to the plus etc and asserting that there are no errors here let's run the tests And, ah, okay, yeah, now we have four tests. So the first one is the duplicate name. The second one is also a duplicate name. Then we are checking for our not supported operation. And then the last one is here, our uh, check for the workbook. Um, let's see if this actually fails. Um, let's do some stuff like this, um, where we now have um, an error here in the program. Um, but we want to ensure that this is completely error free. So let's run the test again. And you can see that the test has failed. Um, if we take a look at um, the error message that we get here in the uh, from the test execution, we can see that an assertion failed because there is a um, operation not supported error somewhere. And in this case, it's on a on the node. Uh, Greater, which is this one here, um, and it prints the actual node ID here. So uh, if we click, if you double click on the test, it only takes you to the to the um, check for error messages. But if you take a look down here in the actual test output, um, there's a strange looking number uh, behind the um, greater sign here. So error actually starts here at the um, at the greater expression and this is the node id um, that is what mps internally uses to uniquely identify um, a part of your program okay this node id is only unique within a model so there are two parts um, that uh, uniquely identify program element one part is the ID of the model where it's contained in, so the sandbox model or the type system test model. And then the second part is the ID of the actual node. And MPS supports to search for these um, for these node IDs. Um, I mean, we know where the test case is and we know what the, um, what the ID of the offending node is. Uh, sadly, it's not directly clickable. Mm -hmm. Because the error message is not um, not like um, the uh, the code block here in the in the stack trace, you can't really click the ID 
Um, that's a bit uh, um, bit a thing that is not working at the moment. Um, but you can copy this ID and then go to the test case here by just double clicking um, in the um, test view here on the left side. And now there is in the navigate menu uh, something called go to note by ID. And if we click that, a window opens where we can um, put in a note ID. I have just copied it from the, from the output window here. And if we now click OK, MPS will um, select this, uh, this program element for us. So what it has selected is the, um, the greater, a greater expression here that uh, produced the, um, the test failure. Okay, so let's remove that again and run the test again. Now it should run green. Okay, so now it's green again. Um, what you can also do is uh, you can match, uh, match and mix those two approaches. Mm. Instead of writing um, one workbook that is uh, completely correct and another one where you um, assert individual errors, what you can also say is, okay, on the parent here, on the workbook itself, I'm saying, check for error messages and fail if there are any unexpected error messages. Um, but the check here is smart enough to figure out that there are parts of the workbook here where we expect errors and to exclude them for this check for error messages. Um, if I run the tests now again, all tests are green. Um, so this check here on my workbook under test is now successful because all the parts that are not annotated to um, to have errors have no errors and the parts that um, have expected er uh, have annotations that um, assert that there is a given error also have the error as expected. Um, if I now remove one of these checks here that an error is expected and rerun the test, now the test has failed. Because in this case, uh, we have an unexpected error message on the node X. You see the variable. Um, and um, this is not what we specified as test input. Let's add this back um, so that we are expecting an error here. Okay. Um, the test language also supports other kinds of tests. Um, if we add a common test annotation here, there's a bunch of um, uh, of other assertions that we can add here. Uh, for instance, one is that we want to assert that um, while we took a look at uh, how to report errors um, from the type system, we can report uh, warnings and info messages the same way. So just as for errors and warnings, um, infos can be, uh, you can assert that a certain info message is there. Um, you can also assert that something has um, um, a given type so that the type system has calculated um, the correct type for um, the program that you wrote. Um, in this case, we have this uh, plus of um, this tree of plus expressions that uh, sum up three integers. Um, so we would expect that the integer type. So what we would expect here is that uh, the plus expression tree here um, is correctly typed to um, to integer. If we take a look at the type explorer, we can see that the um, that the type of all of this is um, is our B integer type. Um, and we can also assert that by adding this has type annotation. Um, and I'll run the test again. And um, note type check here, this one. So this is now also successful. Um, uh, that way you can uh, ensure that your type system is calculating the types correctly. Um, this is often interesting when you use a lot of uh, type inference in your in your language. For instance, uh, here, um, as we do not have uh, explicit types annotated to our variables, um, we implicitly get the type from the 
from the initializer here, well, the type of a variable x uh, is also integer. So what we could do is um, we could write notations here that we would like to add common test annotation as type integer. So that way we can um, ensure that the, the inference rules um, behind the scenes worked correctly. Um, what else is there? Um, apart from has type, um, there's has type system error, um, has type system warning. Um, yeah, these are error messages that are not produced by um, these explicit error or warning statements. Um, those would be type mess uh, uh, error messages produced by um, equation system itself. So I think we had um, yeah. Um, let me demo this the easiest way. Uh, yeah, let's define x to be a boolean, and now let's assign twelve to it. What you can see here is that um, the error message here is. Uh, uh, type int is not a subtype of boolean, but nowhere uh, in our uh, type system we define this error message um, manually uh, with uh, one of these uh, error statements. So this is something that um, MPS automatically contributed to the um, uh, um, to to, uh, to our program here because it it basically checked that um, that our equations that we wrote. Uh, do not make sense and they cannot find a, a solution for it. And um, if we now say specify rule reference, MPS automatically figured out um, the error message on the node 12 here was not a user, was not something we specified in our own type system implementation. It was something that came from the um, from the actual runtime and that this is a has type system error and this is something different than your um, than your user-defined error message that you put here. And if we run this test again, okay, the outer one here fails because yeah, okay, now all of our types are messed up, right? So X is no longer a boolean, so this is why the type check here failed, and the error message check here failed because the plus expression has an error. But we can see that the uh, type system check here was successful. Um, and MPS um, calculated automatically that this uh, was a type system error. You know, remove the um, the type here. You can see that this now fails because there is no error from the type system present on our twelve here. Okay, so this is. Um, things you can do with the declarative uh, way of testing your type system. Um, what you can also do is uh, like um, like other ways to test things. Um, one thing you might want to do is um, you want to construct a program here, yeah. workbook, some other workbook. And now we have the test methods down here. So apart from the actual nodes up here where we can um, declaratively test our language and type system, there's the test methods part down here, which allows us to write normal Java code to, to test. Um, my Java test case. So. I've created a single test case in here. Of course, you can create multiple ones, um, but I just so now let's say in this case, for some reason, I decide I would like to check that the workbook here, uh, even if the text, if the name is shown here, uh, also has the um, uh, that the that the property name um, is set to some other workbook. And that not the editor shows something that is not really in the model. Um, yes, it's a quite a constructed case, but um, I would like to show something here. 
Um, what you can do is uh, you can select add test label from the intentions menu here, down here. And now we can give this a name, workbook for instance. And down in the Java code, if we open the code completion menu, uh, workbook now shows up as a variable. And this variable gives us access to the workbook um, that we defined up here. And now we could, um, what's going on here? Okay. Whatever reason, the type system, what the fuck? Okay. Seems like a bug in MPS. What I would like to do is actually why does VB not have a type? Note workbook. Okay, for some reason code completion has given up. Um nice. What I would actually wanted to show is that you can access the workbook here um, as part of the uh, of the test language and then write assertions over it. So we could assert if we could actually type it at the workbook name. Not sure why. Well, some other workbook. One second. Why does it not work? I mean, the type system shows the correct type here, but somehow autocomplete thinks it's not there. Ah. I know what the problem is. We are missing a language here, I think. Yes, okay. So, apparently, it's like a bug when you create the model here. Um, the language we need to interact with instances of our program, it's called uh, as model language, uh, was not imported by default in the um, in the test model here. So there was no way to type the name here. Now it's there and we can type it. So we were somehow missing the dependency to the thing that allows us to interact with uh, with the programs written here. Um, okay, so I have my, my Java test case and in the Java test case, I have a simple assert and that assert manually checks that the name of the workbook we defined up here is uh, equal to some other workbook, which is the expected name, given it. And if we execute the tests now, we can see that a new test case here appeared in the in the test view, which is the my Java test case. And if you double click, um, we can see that uh, this is the, the test case that I just wrote. What can you, or why is it useful? What can you do with it? Um, Sometimes you have a uh, code that you would like to test that is um that is not part of the type system um that is might also not be part of the of the editor definition mm. editor definitions how to test them we will take a look at that later or in the next episode if I'm looking at the at the clock it seems like we are not doing that today anymore um so if you have code that somehow operates on um, elements of the program, it's often very convenient to uh, use your own language to construct these uh, these programs because it's much easier than doing it programmatically. Um, you just write the code once how it should look like. In this case, I'm defining a workbook. I mean, we can also do like stuff um, defining a variable in the workbook here. 
var. Both. And now what we could also do is um, we could say, okay, I would like to assert that um, equals workbook dot content dot size. So in the um, in the content of the workbook, I'm asserting that there's only one content in there. You can do that as well here. We run the test, it's also successful. Um, so you have full access to to everything that you that you defined here, and um, this can be useful when you have Java code that um, somehow operates on on programs, and you want to test it um, in a meaningful way. It's also useful if you have like complex code, for instance, that you use inside of a checking rule. So all of our checking rules, or the only checking rule that we have here. At the moment is quite simple, but you could think of um, plugging in some more sophisticated uh, checking tools behind this, um, and then you might want to um, test this to to greater detail. And then you might not even write all of the code here in the in the checking rule itself. Uh, you might write a helper class, or um, you're using some other means of of of, uh, of reusing the code that you wrote here uh, that you need in in in, a, in your type system, and then you can basically uh, write Java tests for it and feed it programs that you um, that you need for the test case by defining them first up here in the in the notes section and then reusing them in the Java part. Um, if you have algorithms that somehow calculate um, Data from your um, from your your model. Uh, you could also test that here. Later, we might want to use this to test our interpreters. Um, so we don't have interpreters yet, but there is an episode upcoming on that. Um, I hope we can do that before Christmas. Otherwise, it will be pretty early next year, where we write an interpreter for our programs, and then we might also want to test that um, and see if it's. Uh, it's calculating correctly, and um, in that case, we could uh, also use the the asserts here do down here to interact with the the interpreter. Uh, the interpreter then visits our program and uh, interprets the uh, the program for us, and then uh, we can check if the result of the interpretation is what we um, what we expected. Um, there's also a second type of tests that you can write, and this is editor tests. So while all of this here is pretty static, it doesn't really test how you how a user would interact with um, with the with the language and the programs. Um, MPS allows us to define editor test cases as well. Um, what you can do there, I will just give you a quick. Um, impression on what you can do there. I won't go into the details. Um, we could define a workbook here. My workbook, which is empty. And now, so this is the before part, and then it allows us to define a result part. And now what I would like to simulate is that um, the user is um, on the empty line here. And now types var, and then um, I would like to ensure that we have created a variable with no name at the moment, but that the program. So if if we place the cursor here, I would like to simulate that somebody typed um, var var, and then MPS should detect that we wanted to create a variable declaration here at that point, and that it has successfully uh, transformed this. So now I have the before state, I have how it should look um, after, and now we somehow need to tell uh, MPS uh, what we would like to do. So first of all, we need to place the cursor, um, and to do this, there is this, uh, at, in the intention menu, there is this at editor test annotation, uh, and then in parentheses, uh, record um, cursor state. Um, I think the intention should just be called record cursor state. Um, 
If you select that, MPS is adding this, uh, this cell annotation here, um, which it uses to store the information where the cursor was placed. Okay, so now we told MPS where to... So in the before part, we need to tell MPS where we want to place the cursor. And now we need to tell MPS what to do. And what we would like to do is we would like to type some keys. And in this case, we would like to type var. Um, and then we expect that after we have typed var, the program looks like this. So we have a, uh, the workbook is no longer empty. It contains one variable declaration here um, that has no name and no initial. Um, we can also run the test here by right-clicking. Run this one. And it's successful. Um, we could also change what we type. We only type VR, VA, and not v VR. Now let's rerun the test. And now it failed. Yeah. Um, and now we can see that there is an error message here that uh, that there is a difference in uh, child count uh, child count in the role content. Um, it was zero, but expected one, and this is basically here because our um, our transformation that we want to have a variable in the workbook hasn't fired yet because we didn't type the right. Um, right uh, 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 keys here and if we change it back to VAR then the test succeeds eventually okay um, yeah so this is uh, a very very basic example how you can test your editors um, and how you can test if interactions with the program work correctly how much you want to test editors um, that's a different thing uh, in the blog post, I uh, I uh, um, I try to explain why editor tests might be an expensive thing, and you should really think twice if you want to maintain them, especially when the language is under development. Um, yeah, but there's nothing per se against uh, against editor tests. They are just like something that that can require quite a bit of maintenance, especially in the early phases uh, of your language when you're uh, changing editors quite a lot that they tend to break quite often um yeah i think that's it for today um i will check in these tests as well um and push them to github so let me do that um at type system test cases um, at duplicate name checks or statement containers and at basic editor test example Let's commit this and then push it to github Okay. Okay, so as usual, you can uh, find the code on GitHub here. Um, feel free to uh, add comments there, open issues, add pull requests if you think uh, there's something we should add to the language and uh, and you have already implemented it and we should take a look together at the in one of the episodes. Um, yeah. Uh, apart from that, I think today we did quite some, some good things here. So we added our test cases, we fixed our... Um, our variable constraints with the name hiding, etc. Um, how we can uh, do nested scopes, um, and we added some of the basic tests. So next time, I think we will continue with some more examples about how you can use editor tests. Um, and I think I'm going to do um, an episode on 
not any of the i mean we will i will use the the project here but um it's not that i will add any features to the language um on the weekend uh, most probably on uh, on saturday i think at somewhere in the afternoon maybe three four o'clock i haven't really decided yet um so keep an eye on twitter or um or the slack channel um where i will announce this as soon as i know when i will do it most probably on saturday um in the afternoon i'm going to take a look at um, the new release of mps 2018.3 uh, i will also show how to migrate a simple project like this um, and what you need to do there um, and then i will take a look at some of the new features that were introduced and uh, showcase some of them as well so i will do that uh, on the weekend and then the next normal stream where we will continue to develop the language further that is next uh, week tuesday eight o'clock as usual so yeah um see you then uh, have a nice evening and uh, goodbye <laughs>